immediately following this panel, there'll be an opportunity from 12 to 1 to have panelists sign their, their books at the Book Expo um, Courthouse Square. And then at 1 p.m., the next panel is the Brain and Culture at the Matt Gallery. And you can purchase tickets at the door. And um, I'm very excited to have this panel with you today. Uh, I want to thank you for being here. I know that the title of our panel sounded a little overwhelming, so uh, a round of applause for, for you all for taking the week of faith. When I told um, friends and colleagues, yes, Holly, about this panel, their reaction was, what? But um, they had visceral reactions to words like genocide, war, and natural catastrophe. But uh, I see the panel's topic as both hopeful and enlightening. Because despite our human capacity for cruelty and destruction, we also have boundless powers to rebuild that which has been devastated. And that's what we're going to be trying to talk about today. How we can use the tools of society to fight for social, social justice and create art to document and comment on the issues facing our world. So joining me today are three speakers who have worked in their respective spaces to bring awareness, healing and reconciliation, legal redress and cultural vision to the emotional process of each promise. And you will find an extensive bio for each person in your program, but I will give a brief introduction to each speaker, and then we're going to use the first 15 minutes for each of them to speak briefly, briefly about who they are. Sitting to my right is Joseph Sigarenzi, who survived the 1994 Rwandan genocide. He returned to his country to serve as Speaker of the Parliament 1997 to 2000. He was forced to leave the country to ensure his personal safety, and he has written about his experiences in the book, God Sleeps in Rwanda, which has been my companion for the past two weeks, and this guy is in my head. I, when I met him, it was like, oh my God, I've been like with you for the past two weeks. Um, it's an amazing book, and I think there's a lot of Thank you to all of you for being here and uh, be part of this panel. Uh, as she said, and Marcia said, um, my name is Joseph Severenzi. I was born in Rwanda. Uh, and uh, that was uh, during the civil war. Uh, civil war that caused Hutu and Tutsi in Rwanda. 
uh, in that civil war was really harsh uh, to the point that uh, about 20,000 uh, Tutsi were killed and uh, about uh, 300,000 were forced into exile. So that was the beginning of uh, uh, a long story of suffering of many Rwandans and of course myself. Uh, and uh, I remember this uh, psycho violence in 1973 when I was in elementary school. Uh, that's when uh, I was about to see it, witness it, and, uh, and see that uh, our house destroyed uh, completely, everything taken away, and uh, uh, my family uh, narrowly escaped. And after the crisis, I remember my father coming to me and said, my son, you need, you need to leave this country and go to Congo because what happened uh, can happen again. So I had to leave my country, go to Congo, a country where I'd never been before. And it was a very tough experience. But later on, I came back to Rwanda uh, and worked for non-profit organizations. It was very well, well uh, nice. Uh, uh, but uh, another war started in 1990 and I was arrested because the government then thought I was uh, part of the people who uh, attacked the country. I mean, those were two who had left Rwanda uh, many years earlier. So I was in jail for two weeks, but uh, Hutu friends helped me out and uh, I went back to my job eventually. Uh, as the war escalated, I decided to leave Rwanda and go to Burundi. And that was my second time to go into exile. Um, so in Burundi, uh, it was uh, to start over again. It's very tough. Uh, a few um, years later, the genocide took place in Rwanda in 1994. Most of you uh, know about this. And uh, at least 500,000 people were killed, including my father, my mother, and uh, seven of my siblings. So it was a very devastating. Uh, but uh, after that crisis, I decided to go back to Rwanda because after the genocide, it was safe. Uh, and I felt it was a duty to go back to Rwanda to help in reconstruction, to help in reconciliation. So I got involved in peace work, I got involved in the conciliation work, and eventually I became a member of parliament, served as a speaker of parliament, uh, and there my priority was really to have a strong parliament that can uh, serve as check and balance to the executive branch, which was very powerful, but it was very hard, uh, especially in terms of uh, bringing the president to accept uh, the rule of law in Rwanda. So it, it's a long story. Uh, so event, uh, eventually, of course, um, we succeeded in having a law that gave the parliament the power to control the executive branch of government. We managed to create a commission for unity and reconciliation uh, to also create uh, a commission for human rights so it was very well, and the parliament was very powerful. And the hope for me was to say, if we have strong institutions, we will be able to prevent any other catastrophe that will strike Rwanda again. Uh, so eventually, of course, the president pushed me out, and I resigned, and came to the US as a refugee again. That was the third time. Then uh, I went back to school at the School for International Training, uh, became again active in peace work, taught conflict management, uh, and uh, managed to write this book, managed to finish a PhD. Uh, all that to say, you can suffer. You can suffer a lot in your life, but you should not really uh, change the way you look at things. You, nothing should take away who you are, your kindness. Nothing should derail you 
from the world, your parents, your teacher told you where to go. You need to keep your kindness, move forward, uh, learn to forgive, uh, learn to reconcile. And it's not just uh, good words, because there are reasons why we should really embrace forgiveness and reconciliation. That is, it is for peace for future generations. If we fight each other, we respond to evil with evil, it means we are perpetuating the cycle of violence. And our children, and when I talk about children, I think of my own children because I have uh, two, two uh, sons and three daughters. If I go on going after the people who victimize me, it means I'm making those people into victims and they will go after my children. And this cycle of violence that went from my grandmother to my mother to myself can reach my children. And that is really wrong. And also, of course, most of us have belief and faith that whatever happened to us, we should really remain who we are, respond to evil with good. Because then we are who we should really be. And another aspect, of course, another motivation to me is that uh, when you keep your anger toward your offender, you keep resentment, you are really destroying your, your child. Your emotional, your physical health is being destroyed. And, I mean, you are doing what your offender wants you to do, meaning destroying yourself. So it, it's a long story, of course. So, and I always say, each of us can try to do that. And if I can try, for sure, anyone can, can try. It's not easy, it's a struggle, and that's why I use the word a journey of transformation. It's a journey, sometimes you go back, but you remind yourself that you need to move forward and you continue the goal. Right, well, it's, it's, it's a goal, and it's certainly something that we need to look at. But on the other hand, we have Kelly to discuss legal ramifications and the law, and that's what she's been involved with. So, Kelly, you want to speak a little bit about your work? In, in the early 1990s, I was um, a lawyer, but trying to figure out, I, you know, you could read the news, and there was so much um, terrible things happening in the world, and there was very little response to, to these things. So. I decided to um, go back and get a, a, an advanced degree in law to, um, to work in the area of international human rights law. And uh, during this time, I was at the World Conference on Human Rights in 1993, and I met uh, women who had been in rape camps in Bosnia. And the war was still raging. Um, the, the UN Security Council, for the first time, to set, decided to set up an um, international criminal tribunal to prosecute war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide uh, in the former Yugoslavia. And it, this was the first time uh, ever the UN had set up a war crimes tribunal to respond to atrocities. But if, if you'll recall, um, there were war crimes trials after World War II in Germany and in, in Japan, but they were uh, sort of victor's justice. It was set up by the, uh, the victors of the war uh, to prosecute um, the, the vanquished folk. So this is the first truly international war crime tribunal. When I was at the uh, World Conference on Human Rights and at other meetings, there was debate about whether rape was even a war crime. And so that's when I decided to do my doctorate on and how to prosecute uh, war crimes against against women. Um, while I was still working on that, of course, uh, a genocide raged through Rwanda, where, as Joseph said, at least 500,000 people were killed um, in a 100-day period. And because the United Nations had just set up a war crimes tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, it essentially had no choice to set up one also for Rwanda. So it had set up the um, International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda in neighboring Tanzania. And during this period, um, there was also gaining momentum for a permanent International Criminal Court. 
And so in uh, 1998, delegates met in, in Rome for six weeks to create a permanent international criminal court. So the tide sort of from years and years of impunity was changing to um, a, a growing recognition that for mass atrocities, there needs to be some sort of response. So in a very short period of time, um, I was, during that time, uh, working with the Yugoslav and Rwanda tribunals, primarily on gender issues, but not exclusively. And I was, you know, at the, at the conference to create a permanent international criminal court. And uh, starting mostly to um, work as consultants. I worked in registries, in the prosecution, in chambers. But at the same time, other atrocities were occurring around the world. This year, Leon, they ended up setting up in 2000-2001 uh, a war crimes tribunal to prosecute um, mass atrocities there. Um, Charles Taylor is currently uh, the former president of Liberia, currently on trial in The Hague. In East Timor, um, in 1999, uh, total uh, mass slaughter, mass rape, set up the War Crimes Tribunal there. Uh, the Sierra Leone and East Timor courts um, are not international, they're hybrid, so they're located in the countries where the crimes were committed, instead of far away in Hague. Um, and they have a combination of local and international judges, prosecutors, defense counsel. Uh, so in many ways, uh, sort of having greater impact um, affect the communities and greater capacity building in the country. Um, and, and then other countries started saying, hey, hey, what about us? Cambodians said that there was genocide in our country. Sure, sure, it was 30 years ago, but don't we deserve justice? <coughs> so the UN uh, partnered with Cambodia and it also set up a, a war crime tribunal to go back and look at the crimes committed in 75 to 79 where uh, 1.6 million Cambodians, uh, a third of the population, were killed. So I've been privileged over the years to go back and forth between working in the tribunals and academia um, until, uh, until six years ago when I went to work the job that I currently have at the, um, I had the International Justice Program at the Society Justice Initiative and my sole mandate is to assist in the work of all the war crimes tribunals. So I spent a great deal of time in Congo, I spent a great deal of time in Cambodia, um, um, on the border of Sudan, to work ma mainly with uh, victims groups, but also certainly with, with the tribunals to try to figure out how to bring some measure of justice um, to the victims of these crimes. Okay, that's great, thank you. Ed, you're coming from a totally different place. You're our cultural representative, so to speak. Um, could you speak to how you've been bringing awareness to a lot of issues through your uh, photographic work and multimedia work? Yeah. Well, thank you all for being here. It's an honor to be with you guys, all of you. And, uh, um, you know, I've been a photojournalist for almost 30 years now, and um, through this profession, this kind of work, I've, I've traveled extensively around the world. I've seen many, many things. But over the course of my career, over my life, I've, I've also come to realize that I have to devote myself to certain issues that really touch my heart or really grab me, whether it's as a journalist, intellectually, emotionally, or hopefully the combination of all those things. And so over the years, I've focused on The Kurds, which is uh, one of the books I've published. Um, I also spent eight years looking at aging in America. I thought, you know, after working abroad for so many years, that, it w that I, was, I was yearning to turn my camera on my own culture, on my own society. And as I looked around at, you know, what would, what would be one of the great themes of my lifetime, I, I realized that aging would be one of them. And in the great tradition of, of documentary photography, going all the way back to Jacob Rees, who exposed child labor in New York in the turn of the century, there's a great, great heritage of, of photographers devoting themselves to an issue and over time developing a body of work that becomes almost like a living testament, a document, a reflection of that moment, the intricacies of that issue, but hopefully lives on. And so aging for me became that. 
And uh, it also became a personal journey because it's a case where being a journalist made me a better human being. And after spending eight years looking at that <coughs> issue, when my father-in-law, who between my wife and I was the only surviving parent, became um, showing signs of dementia, we moved from San Francisco to New Jersey to take care of him. And he lived his last two years with us in our home in Moncton, New Jersey. And, passed in our home with the family around. And so I never would have done that if I hadn't worked on, on the issue of aging. So I'm, uh, it's exciting to think that the work you devote yourself to, the issue you might devote yourself to also, whatever you create also makes you a better person, sort of teaches you how to be uh, yeah, a better human being. And then more recently, I've devoted a number of years to looking at the issue of oil in the Niger Delta, which uh, when I began this in 2004, I didn't quite realize how important it was, it would be as an issue. And now, um, for me, it, it encapsulates a kind of an, uh, um, an approach to my work, which is advocacy journalism. And that idea that, especially having done this for quite a while, that it's not good enough to have you know, the cover of the New York Times or magazine or the National Geographic, that that, that to me is a starting point. You know, earlier in my career, that would have been the end point. But now that's a starting point. The idea is to create media materials, which in this case now are not just still images, but also moving imagery and audio and text, and get that into the hands of people who can really make a difference, whether they are educators, you know, academics, foundations, even corporations sometimes, who, whoever it may be, lawyers. I even did some pictures of the Niger Delta f for a, a law firm that was representing a village in the Niger Delta against Chevron, doing a pro bono. Uh, and I, it was the first time I had ever been asked to take pictures purely as documentation. Like, here's the school that wasn't built that Chevron, you know, things like that, where it wasn't about artistry or aesthetics. It was about here's information to help uh, this law firm, you know, prosecute a case for, um, for these villagers in the middle of the Niger Delta. So this journey of being a, a photojournalist has, um, and I think we're all experiencing this with the digital revolution, no matter what we do, it's impacted our lives. Um, it's profoundly changed things, you know, the way I do my work has profoundly changed from when I began. And for me, one of the really important things, and that's why I'm here today, is this idea of advocating the issue for the issues that I have become involved in as a journalist, and hopefully to have a greater impact with that. I, work. I would urge you all to go look at um, Ed's website because it's just totally amazing, um, and you can see all the different portfolios that he's taken. And if anybody doubts the power of the photograph, just think about uh, all the ads that BP put on saying how they were going to stay stay uh, in uh, the area until everything was straightened out, and then the one picture of the bird covered in oil. So we know how powerful that can be. Um, Kelly, I, w I would like you, before we go back into Joseph's discussion of, of reconciliation, to talk just really briefly to give some of the people here some legal um, grounding on the, the concept of accountability for crimes committed against individuals or communities. Um, and how that's being structured to help those victimized move forward after the atrocities or the, or the catastrophes. You, you've kind of outlined to me when we spoke prior certain steps. So if you could share that with the audience, that would be helpful for them to see the tangible um, ways that society is looking at things. And then we'll go back to Joseph and, and Ed. Well, in the last 17 years, we have, as I've said, started a trend toward uh, accountability instead of impunity. And so the UN has had uh, a couple of different experts to say what does, what are the rights of victims? Because, you know, it, when you talk about atrocity crimes, um, you know, the, the victim population is mass, massive and they need different things. There's not like one, one need for um, each victim. And so the UN experts on combating impunity has come up with four pretty concrete things that, that rights that victims have. Um, one is the right to know. Uh, that might be the right to know the truth about what happened, uh, the right to know who is most responsible for the crimes, uh, the right to know where your family's loved ones are buried, uh, it's, it's a broad range of rights. The second right is the right to justice, to the right to have 
some measure of accountability for uh, the crimes committed. And, and most of these people, you know, as you heard on, on Joseph's story, they weren't simply had their mother killed or their wife raped or their, they lost, many of them, everything. They lost their homes. They had, they lost their families. Many of them lost their countries. They lost huge amounts. It's not a simple, you know, domestic crime. These are just massive um, uh, efforts to destroy, to destroy a people. And so um, it's, it's a little bit about justice for these people. Um, there's the right to reparation, and that means many different things. Um, it means, it might mean uh, compensation, it might mean uh, psychosocial support, it might mean if you've had your limbs hacked off, uh, having some sort of uh, uh, medical uh, assistance, you know, it, it means a, a range of different things. And the fourth is it's guarantees of non-reoccurrence. Some people put that in the third. Um, but basically saying uh, it's sort of prevention that this, this won't happen to you again. You're able to move forward with your life. Um, I think I'll just stop there. Okay, that, that's great. Um, Can I make a connection? This sure, is that, absolutely. Uh, when you mentioned the right to know, because um, my work on the Niger Delta has been actually adopted by Revenue Watch, which is another Soros Foundation organization, and, and Oxfam and, and, and Amnesty International, of, um, of um, this idea when it comes to extractive industries, we also have a right to know. Where is all the money going? Oil, gas, and mining and particularly for the people of the Niger Delta, that's very relevant. But other countries where extractive industries go in, I mean, it is a form of neocolonialism, it really is. I know it's cliche, but it's true. I mean, we go in there in the guise of corporations as opposed to armies, and we, we you know, are involved in extracting their materials, which is fine, we need those things, but the people who live there are getting absolutely nothing. In fact, their countries and their infrastructure and development has gone backwards. And that's just not fair and it's, and it's just not sustainable. I mean, it's just not sustainable. I just don't think we can, I mean, look at, you know, Pennsylvania, you guys, are, this place has known extractive industries for maybe as long as any place in quite a while, certainly since the Industrial Revolution began. And anyway, I think that we need to, like you're talking about human, you know, impact on people, uh, specifically in terrible atrocities that happen, there's this other element. When you said the right to know, because that's a campaign that Oxfam was involved in, and then to end this point. And what was on a practical level, and this was very exciting to see how my work or the idea of media work can be involved with this, is a, is a public campaign to support a bill that was in Congress, which was uh, you know publish what you pay, this idea of transparency. So when Chevron or whatever oil company um, goes into a place like Nigeria and they sign a contract that they need to say this is how much money we are making, this is how much oil and gas we're extracting, and this is how the money is being used. So that there is more transparency. Now again we need these corporations to do their work and we need them to do a great job, right? But a great job isn't just making a profit. Okay? A great job is also taking care of the people and taking care of the land. Yes. Well. Thank you. That, that, that also speaks to something that Joseph brought up in his book, which was if Rwanda had had certain um, mineable or, or, or oil or whatever, would, would the world have been a little bit more interested in what was going on there? And um, in, in his book, he, he lays out his journey from, from innocence to knowing, from you know, playing with his, his uh, classmates who are both uh, Tutsi and Hutu to learning about why he and his, his mother have to hide in the bush. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like watching, when I was reading this book, I knew, thank God, he was going to be okay. But it was like this, this overview of, of saying, no, they're not going to do the right thing. They're not going to do the right thing. And even when he gets into government, he, he goes from trying to use the tools of government and governance to disillusion with the failure that comes about due to corruption. And when he says he left, he had to leave because he was going to be killed. So I just want to make that, that clear. It wasn't like, oh, you know, I'm going to leave now. It's like the head, of, the head of the country wants me dead and I got to go. 
and um, he relates a lot about his relationship with his wife and his family and all the times that they had to separate and it was just it was amazing and he also traces his evolution from anger to some kind of religious faith and and reconciliation there's a, a moving passage in the book where he talks about the mayor of his town, who he knows was, was very involved in, in genocide. But he sees him in a prison, and he sees he's suffering in a certain way. And in that moment, it's like a, a moment of re revelation for him. So I would like it if you could talk briefly about the role of faith and spirituality in healing from trauma and then taking it to the next level in the afterword of your book, which I think everybody in Politics 101 should read, you discuss reconciliation, acknowledgement, ap apology, restorative justice, empathy, reparation, and forgiveness. Because we can have all the laws and the kind of work that Kelly's doing, but unless there's a basic mindset change, we're operating on two different planes that aren't necessarily connecting. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, when you talk about justice and uh, in the aftermath of a, a mass violence, uh, it's something very complex. Yes, uh, we need the work uh, uh, Kelly is doing, uh, meaning to take those uh, responsible for crime and bring them to justice and see them prosecuted, punished. It's very good uh, because then those individuals won't be able to hide uh, uh, I mean, behind their communities. Because like in Rwanda, people tend to say, OK, the Hutu did this. But in fact, these were individuals within the Hutu community who engaged in genocide. Those individuals, not the community, they have to be identified and brought to justice. You have the Tutu who went after Hutu after the crime and committed revenge killings. You cannot just say, oh, the Tutsi did this. No. There are individuals within the Tutsi community who committed a crime, and those need to be taken to justice and punished. So all of that is really good, and, uh, and we need it in uh, any post-conflict situation. But in a country like Rwanda, where you have hundreds of thousands of people who committed a crime, what do you do? Can you bring 100,000 people to court? It's impossible. And also, in a post-conflict situation, like uh, in Rwanda, where you have Hutu and Tutsi who live side by side, who attend the same school, the same market. The focus should not be punishment. The focus should be rebuilding relationships. How do you bring the two communities together again and live in peace and move on? That's where uh, my work really uh, is. Uh, to say, after crisis like this, uh, we need to use our faith, we need to use our logic to find out what works uh, and what does not work. Uh, and when it comes to reconciliation, uh, it would be good to encourage everyone to come at the table and ask the offender to at least admit what they have done. When they admit and when they make apology, and they commit to never do that again. And of course, uh, accept to participate in the reparation, like uh, uh, rebuild the house that was uh, uh, destroyed. Uh, all of that can really help a survivor like me to come up and say, yes, I forgive you, and I will never take revenge. So that process is very, very important. It helps. And it also it helps in a sense that uh, when you sit together, like in the same way that was done in South Africa, 
as a genocide survivor or as a, a survivor, a victim, listening to your offender explain why, why did you do this? Maybe that person will, will tell you the story, the context, and it will help you to find that, in fact, that person, that offender is not a fundamental uh, evil. He has some humanity and he can change. Maybe you can, you can list the whole story. For instance, in Rwanda, some people committed a crime, not because they were bad people necessarily, but because the government at the time asked them to do it. If you don't do it, you'll be killed. Or because the people were so poor, they thought by killing my neighbor, I would take over the land. So things like that. So, I mean, there was a context of war, a history of violence that sometimes can make anyone into an offender. So when you listen to all of that as a genocide survivor or as a victim, you may have some, some empathy. And it may trigger some forgiveness and find ways to live with that person again, to help that person become uh, a peaceful person again, become your neighbor again, and uh, move forward. But some people don't do that. Some people don't even admit they have committed a crime. They don't. They say, I did nothing. Like the mayor of my hometown, I found a prison in 1995. I asked him if he was involved, and he said, no, I was not involved. And I knew he was. But of course, as we mentioned, because that guy was really suffering, suffering, I used to see him as a big man, a boss, and, uh, and in the prison, he didn't have enough to eat. He was really suffering. And before I left, I gave him some money to buy food. I mean, at that particular time, I don't know why I took that decision, but my anger, my suffering somehow went away and I focused on that man who was suffering. And they said, this is a human being, regardless of what he did, and he needs help. And they have the duty, I felt I had to help him. So, what I mean is, some people will never admit they have done wrong. But then, what do you do? Do you become like them and go and kill them? No, it's wrong. You just need to remain who you are. You just need to remain who you are and do good. Maybe by doing good to those who did wrong to you, it can somehow change them a little bit. Or at least by avoiding making them into victims, you are helping to stop that cycle, uh, that cycle of, of violence. So, uh, so it's very complicated, uh, very complicated in the context like Rwanda, but I try to tell people, you know, it has happened. Let's focus not on prosecutions. Yes, we need prosecution, at least for those at the top. But those other hundreds of thousands of people, let's find ways to live with them in peace. Uh, for those reasons I mentioned, and coming back to my faith, maybe, which is one of my motivations. Uh, I think it this way. Uh, we all have some faith. You may be Christian, you may be uh, Hindu or Muslim, but all those religions, they teach us reconciliation, not retaliation. They teach us not revenge, but forgiveness. So if we are really serious with our faith, we should live by our faith. Like I grew up in a, in a Christian family and uh, we were always taught not to overcome evil with evil. Try to overcome evil with good. Because if you do what your offender did to you, then you are not making any difference. And sometimes people tell me, how can you talk, even talk about forgiveness when it is about the genocide. Yes, of course, genocide is so horrid. You cannot forgive it, but you can forgive the people who committed genocide. And it reminds me in, in my faith, uh, when Jesus was talking with uh, Peter, one of his disciples, 
and uh, Peter said, how many times should I forgive the people who sin against me? Should I forgive them seven times? And Jesus said, not seven times, but seven times seven, something like that. I mean, many times. There is nothing you cannot really uh, forgive. Uh, you can forgive this, but it does not mean you give up justice. It does not mean you condone what was done. But it means, at a personal level, you need really to be who you are and not become an offender. And I always tell people, don't do your best not to behave like your offender. And even in Islam, I remember reading the Quran where it is said that he who forgives and reconciles with his enemy will receive his reward from God. So all of these spiritualities, the faith, they teach reconciliation, not, not retaliation. So if we are serious, let's live by that. But of course, that's, that is one, it's, it's just one, one of my motivation that keeps me going. Mm -hmm. And others are, what I said, to break that cycle of violence and make sure it does not reach our children, our grandchildren. And the other one, of course, is when you forgive and when you try to have the anger out of yourself, I mean, it helps your health. But if you keep that inside yourself, it's really destroying you and studies have shown that the people who hold on anger, on resentment, they suffer heart attacks and many other diseases. So let me start. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the, in the middle of all that, one of the questions that I had is, what lessons aren't we learning? Um, and one of the, the phrases that Joseph uses in his book is political will. And when I was doing some research before the panel, I was thinking about the Armenian genocide. And um, as a response to the continuing denial of the, of the Armenian genocide by the Turkish state, activists have, have pushed for formal recognition of the genocide from various governments around the world, which is part of this whole healing process that Joseph is talking about. Um, 20 countries and 42 U.S. states have adopted resolutions acknowledging the genocide as a bona fide historical event. And then uh, just in March of this, this year, the U.S. Congressional Panel uh, voted very narrowly that the incident was indeed genocide. And within minutes, the Turkish government had issued a statement critical of this resolution, which accused Turkey of a crime that it said it had never committed which is exactly what Joseph is talking about. As a nation, instead of as an individual, they said, this never happened. So we, we are dealing at a world, in a world where political considerations are at play. And just two days ago, there was a, a call uh, from a former high-level person, Brent Scrocoft, for a closer U.S.-Turkey relationship based on Turkey as a key player um, in the United States' need for whatever they need in the Middle East with uh, the armies in Iraq and uh, et cetera. So I wanted to pose a, a question to everybody. Uh, President Obama has been caught up in this disconnect because when he was uh, campaigning, he, he gave his um, assurances to the um, Armenian community that he supported them, he supported this recognition. But he has, at this point, abstained from using the, the term genocide because of all these other political factors. And the question is, when do we put our foot down? It's like a continuum. When is like, well, all right, you know, we got to do this because this is what we need for other things. But here we are denying a people a recognition of a genocide. So um, who wants to jump on that? Well, I've spent a lot of time in Turkey. and. Um and actually, the Armenian genocide was, was most of the killers were Kurds, actually. Uh -huh. Because the Kurds are Muslim and the Armenians are Christian. And when Kamel Ataturk, the father of modern Turkey, out of the ruins of the Ottoman Empire after World, World War I, assembled, and he did many great things assembling um, the modern state of Turkey. But he was also uh, uh, almost a model for like 20th century um, 
dic not dictator, like uh, like a fascist. Mm -hmm. You know, Hitler, Mussolini. I mean, there were things he did, and so deeply ingrained in the Turkish um, mentality and political body is this idea that there are no Kurds, they're mountain Turks, and that we didn't do this to the Armenians. And it's to me part of a very kind of racist, very, and I love Turkey and, I, and the Turkish people are amazing in many ways, but they are, like we all have, these blind spots, or I don't know what you would call them, these places that they just can't go. And I don't know if it's because of politics within Turkey. You know, if Erdogan, the prime minister said, you're right, we did commit a genocide, now can we move on? Mm -hmm. Would he be thrown out of office? Would he be killed? I don't know. I don't uh -huh. know. Or maybe he sincerely believes that, but, you know, but there's just, we are still in a world where people are incredibly um, weak, blind, racist, uh, unable it, to, to shed the, 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 the sort of, um, the tribalism. Mm -hmm. But I think getting back to the question of, of political will. Well, um, Obama can't afford to lose Turkey. Turkey is an integral player in the in the in with with Israel, you know, with this whole. Right. So what do we do? We're, we're we're back to square one. I mean, I, I don't know. Some of this is words. Some of this is just words and semantics to me. I mean, I think most of the world knows that there was a genocide against the Armenians. And but does that help the Ar Armenians who are looking for that kind of validation that that Joseph kind of sees yeah. it as as the as a step in in the. Acknowledgement, or what Kelly was saying is, yeah, this happened. I'm not, we're not delusional. Right. Um, just to jump a little bit uh, askew to that, um, jo Joseph uh, wrote in his book, and I read that at six this morning, um, <laughs> <laughs> genocide does not come without warning. People don't awake one morning and say, I'm going to kill my neighbor because he is different from me. The path to genocide builds slowly, first by categorizing people. One group becomes us, the other group becomes them. And um, I, I took an, a sample, an example from something that's happening in Europe now, which is the case of the Roma in, in France. And um, what I wanted to, to throw out to the panel was, was the question of, when, when does something that seems like, hmm, should that be happening, become a red flag? When, when do we get to the point where we say, you know what, this is not cool. We've got to be doing something about this. So that years afterwards, people like Bill Clinton and Kofi Annan don't have to say, you know what, we made a, we made a mistake in Rwanda. We should, have, we should have done X, Y, and Z. How can we become the gatekeepers and do like what Ed is saying in, in his work, or, or um, um, Joseph is saying in a granular sense as individuals, everything that we do as individuals impact the greater world. So here's an example of something that's happening with the Roma um, who've, who've been kicked out of one country after another. And also in our own country, how, how do we, we um, see when things are going off the deep end? How do, how do we deal with other people's um, points of view, which we find extremely different. Um, this also, I'm, I'm, I'm mixing, making a big mix up here, and then everybody can, can jump I in. I have but the answer. We need more people like Joseph. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> I know. We will. <laughs> that goes without saying, but, you know, in the middle of all this, in, I, I live in New York City, and um, I'm sure some of you have heard about the fact that um, a, a mosque and a community center wanted to get built not too far from ground zero, and everybody went crazy. Um, uh, the 9-11 event that we have every year where people's names are read, which is a very solemn event, got taken over by people screaming at each other on either side. Um, <coughs> some of the people who were screaming may not know that there were um, almost 100 Muslims that were killed in the 9-11 devastation. Um, there are people whose fam who have lost family members who have wanted re re reconciliation, as Joseph is saying, and who, who are talking about how this could be a good thing. Um, of course, my own issue is I didn't realize that there were uh, girly bars right near uh, th this whole sacred ground. So, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering how people draw all these kinds of uh, value judgments about what's okay why a religion that, that, that wants to plan something to, to be healing 
is, is offensive and how, again, I'm, I get really nervous. This is a country that sent people to internment camps during World War II. So um, we have Muslim people who live in our country who are, who are citizens, who are part of our country. And are we going to take the easy road or are we going to do the right thing? So um, I would love for you all to pick one of those things and um, say something intelligent. <laughs> and then we'll do Q&A. No, well, you've done a lot of work in the 9-11 area, so. Um, I mean, I've, the last 20 years, I've spent the equivalent of years in the Muslim world working. And uh, I was actually just in Marseille in France last week doing a story about Muslims in Europe and, and was involved th directly with groups helping the Roma who were being pushed out and, and, and all that. And you think France, for all its uh, sort of uh, you know, egalitarianism and you know, very progressive ways, Sarkozy is um, it's the pushing strain. some really racist maneuvers right now. But I am deeply concerned about what's going on in our country and in the world. I feel that somehow when communism ended, or we had to replace it with another bogeyman and we made that the Muslims. And uh, I don't know, you know, like, I know this seems so cliche or silly in a way, but it's so true is that the majority of people in the Muslim world are incredibly moderate people. And I feel what we are doing is we're abdicating the debate to the voices of extremists right now. Uh, we, we really are. And, f and, and for me, well, I'll leave it at that. But, um, and there are those voices that are in America, some who have been in power, as well as bin Laden, or some people in Israel. And, and I don't know, Joseph, if you, if you would make that parallel to what happened in Rwanda, but what happens when like, all the good people who are the majority of us yeah. just shut up? and allow these extremists on all ends control the debate. Absolutely. And then all these moderates get scared. And then it's the us versus them. Exactly. So right now, we just took in, and I'll try to make this very quick, and I'll stop. Um, we just took in a month ago for a full year a 27-year-old woman from Yemen, full headscarf, all that. She got a scholarship to ICP in New York, International Center of Photography, first Yemeni in the history of ICP to get a scholarship, to get a visa. She needed someone to host her. We decided to do that. You know, we thought it'd be good for our kids, 12, 15 year olds, to have someone from another culture, all this stuff. And it's been fascinating to watch the reaction to her when she's in the house, she's uncovered, you know, because she considers it home. Um, we're, we're not, I'm not religious, but our, my background's Jewish, so you know I think she's sort of interested that she's with a Jewish family, even though we're totally not religious, we're completely secular. But um, then she goes out in the world and puts on the headscarf and everything changes. Hmm. Everybody reacts to her differently. And she's very beautiful and she's very sweet and smart and incredibly courageous, incredibly courageous, coming from the world she comes from. And uh, anyway, and I'm thinking this is the way I, this is the little, little way that we can, I can be, as I've talked too much about it, like an ambassador in a sense, to try to bring the world together, not splinter it apart. And I, why are we allowing these forces in our own country who, who for, getting, for political gain, are doing this? Why are we allowing that? I don't understand it, and it worries me. Do you want to make a comment? But do we have questions? Is, are there any questions from the audience? I want to make sure we do the Q and A. Okay. Can we start with you? Um, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the panel for a wonderful uh, expose on your work. I think all of it is very important work. My first question is to Patty. You've been the quiet one. Give you an opportunity to um, say a little more. Um, Previous to the Balkans and Rwanda, rape was a part of war. It was collateral damage. Mm -hmm. Women's bodies were, um, as it were, um, spoils of war. Um, can you speak to, and, and you just, you mentioned uh, your work uh, with uh, the, the, the war tribunal in Europe as well as the interest in what was happening in Europe as well. Can you connect the two, especially when the Akaya case um, came up and its significance to now viewing rape as a weapon of war? 
can you expand on that a little bit? Sure, thanks uh, very much for the question. Um, I, I'm actually one of the few people who says uh, that rape was prosecuted at Nuremberg and at Tokyo. Um, it, it was a recognized um, a crime back then, and a, a great deal of sexual violence got into the record. Um, mass rape, sexual slavery, forced prostitution, forced sterilization, forced abortion, all of this is in the transcripts at Nuremberg. I sat and read through the 42 volumes because in the 732 page index, they didn't bother to include rape or, or women or you know any sex crime. So people think that it wasn't prosecuted. Um, and that's why you know 50 years later, there was debate whether rape was even a war crime. Um, A.Q. who was probably, a, a, it was the first case that came out of the Rwanda tribunal and the single most uh, groundbreaking case in history on gender justice. Originally, uh, just a, a very quick, it wasn't even charged, despite the fact that uh, women's groups and NGOs were sending letters saying he should have been charged with rape crimes. Uh, there happened to be uh, a female judge sitting on the panel in the midst of trial. A woman talked about um, uh, the, the, the gang rape of her six-year-old um, her six-year-old daughter and the subsequent witness t talked about that she had been raped and she'd witnessed many other rapes and so the judges invited the prosecution to consider going back and investigating and and if they found charges uh, attributable to Akiyasu to amend the indictment and that's exactly what happened and so you know we have uh, because of the presence of women uh, at senior uh, places um, now the most groundbreaking uh, case in history that found rape as part of the genocide in Rwanda and rape as a crime against humanity. So since so 1993 debate whether rape is a war crime, 17 years since then we have um, uh, rape is a war crime, a crime against humanity, an instrument of genocide, a form of persecution, a form of enslavement, a means of torture. Uh, we have uh, a total mindset change that, yes, of course, uh, it's, it's part of, uh, you know, it's, it's a very serious crime and one of the most serious crimes committable. That may be rhetoric, but it's not always uh, in practice. It's still these tribunals without enormous pressure outside uh, don't like the rape cases they don't like to prosecute them it's only when uh, there's mostly NGOs who stand up and, and argue that, that it gets in but nonetheless I mean the jurisprudence is remarkable in a sh very short period of time uh, the permanent international criminal court that has cases now in uh, eastern Congo in Uganda in um, in Sudan in in uh, in Kenya, all of the Central African Republic, virtually the entire Central African Republic charges <coughs> against uh, uh, Bimba are for rape and sexual slavery. Um, a, a great deal of this has only been because of pressure from NGOs and women in positions of power within the tribunals who, who will force the issue. And that's not to say there aren't some really wonderful men working on these issues too, but it has been mostly women's NGOs. We've made a huge amount of progress, but we have a huge amount, you know, and certainly the Rwanda Tribunal, there's I think been seven significant rape cases but most of the uh, cases they've dropped. There have been more acquittals than there have been convictions. They've dropped tons of the rape cases. So, I mean, it's, it's certainly not all rosy. Other questions? Is that a question, sir? You addressed earlier the idea of the, the, the futility of maintaining unsustainable system and the kind of psychosis it brings within society. The question I have for you is, it's visible that the extractive-based economy of endless growth is a short-term proposition. It's being hemmed in by resource, resource constraints, climate constraints, pollution sinks in relationship to the limits of the oceans. It's a dead end. It's heading right over a cliff. And fortunately, it's resulting in kind of a barbaric response on part of our society. The question I have is, is it of equal value and equal importance for us to work to raise people's awareness of the fact that Look, at it. not only are, are these individual isolated aspects of this society barbaric and increasingly violent, but this whole system 
of giantism. Growth in service to giantism is no longer futile. And our response should be decentralization, small is beautiful, forget trying to maintain massive corporations, forget trying to maintain massive states. And there are people like yourself, as I'm, I'm a poet, okay? As, a, as a poets and artists, our response is to resist these centralized states and inform people <coughs> they're gonna take us to a planetary end, end zone, in my opinion. I mean, isn't that it? it you sound important. like a socialist. I am, I'm, 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 I am, I am a socialist. I'm making no bones about it. Capitalism is an unmitigated disaster. Well, I. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, you know, it's. I don't know. I, I have no problem with large organizations doing things well and profiting from them if they do them well. You know, I don't know. It seems to me at this point we need, you know, it's funny, I always look at McDonald's as a great example of, they do such a great job at delivering this uniform product all over the world. Why can't they just make it healthy? <laughs> you know, like, so, you know, what, yeah, so the oil companies, it's incredible when you witness what they do. It's like man on the moon technology. It's incredible. Why can't they figure out how to do it? Maybe make it like the BP oil disaster in the Gulf is such a, perfect, blatant example. You guys didn't have a plan B? Mm -hmm. You know, you're making a billion dollars a month or whatever. You couldn't spend another few hundred million dollars just to have a plan B? What kind of world are we living in? You know, if these are the best and the brightest and they're making decisions like this, there's something terribly wrong. And is it all based on greed? Yes. Are we? Yes. 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 <laughs> so I, I think that I think in certain areas, this idea of sort of capitalism, whatever you want to call it, the way modern society is evolving, there's some huge problems with it. It is unsustainable. But there are also some things that are very good about the way it all works, you know, and, and, and I, I would rather build on them and make them better. But I think when it comes to food and certain other areas, of sort of human civilization, I wish we would decentralize it. Mm -hmm. I think it makes more sense. Smaller farming, so all these things make more sense. Um, but how do you, how does that jive with this need for the Walmarts of the world, so to speak, who need to take over the whole world? I don't know. I'm not smart enough to figure these things out. But what I know is it's not sustainable and it's yes. not gonna work if it continues this way. That's all I know. And just when it comes to Nigeria in particular, we, America takes 50% of Nigeria's oil. So we have damn well have a responsibility there. Because these lights would not be working without Nigerian oil. And whoever drove here wouldn't have been able to fill their tank up with cheap gas without Nigerian oil. So it does matter that the average Niger person in the Niger Delta lives on a dollar a day. And their lives are worse off than they were 50 years ago before oil was discovered. And it's connected to rape, and it's connected to genocide. It's connected to all yeah, these things in my mind. Yes, you have a question. In terms of addressing some of the fundamental problems that we have as a human race, do you feel the time has come for us to ask ourselves once again, who are we as a species, and why are we here? <laughs> yes. Yes. I don't, are you, is that to me? <laughs> well, I, all I want to know is how are you able, I can't believe that you, and I don't mean to harp on this, lost your mother and your father and seven of your siblings and you are still so beautiful and you gracious know, I, and I think to, at peace. I don't, I, I mean, don't I want some you of that. You have to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> I, think it's should, uh, I think we can uh, refer to this, uh, this story. Um, between the teacher and the students, uh, where the teacher was asking the students uh, to answer a question. And the question was, uh, how, when can you tell the night has ended and the day has begun? So it, the question seemed to be very easy, right? And the one student said, it's when you can uh, look at uh, an animal in distance and you can tell uh, whether it's a sheep or a dog. And the teacher said, no. Another student said uh, it's when you can look at a child in the distance and you can tell uh, whether the child is a boy or a girl. And the teacher said, no. And they just said, actually, the answer is it's when you can look in the face of any human being 
and you can see that it is your brother or your sister. If you cannot tell, then it is still night. The other um, tale, the Native American tale, you, you, you might want to end our panel with about the wolf feeding. Oh, feeding the, yeah. yeah. yeah okay, it's, a, it's actually the idea that uh, there are forces within each person. There are forces uh, fighting each other. And uh, so the, the, the grandfather was uh, talking about those forces and the, the grandson uh, asked, what are those forces? Because the, the grandchild felt that uh, inside himself there were two forces fighting each other. And the grandfather said, one is the evil. And the evil is uh, symbolized by uh, greed, uh, uh, hatred, uh, war. I mean, this idea of uh, war, uh, animosity. So you have all those negatives. We have that inside ourselves. And the other force is, the other animal is uh, forgiveness, uh, love, uh, reconciliation, empathy. Uh, so the, the, this child, the grandson, asked which force would then win? If they, are, they keep fighting, they keep fighting, which one will win? <laughs> and the grandfather in his wisdom said, the one that wins is the one that you feed. I mean, the one you feed every day and mm. what you do is the one that will prevail. So which means we are good people but we also have some evil side, each of us. Don't mislead yourself thinking you are a good person, no. We may be good today, and bad tomorrow, or bad morning. <laughs> but the key is, if we can really try to take that journey of transformation and do what is good, when people insult you, you don't insult back. You do good. When you find your enemy suffering, you give him or her something. I mean, those little acts of kindness, as you do it, it becomes part of your life. And as you do it, you help your neighbor to behave the same way. And if, if we could do it on a large scale, I think the, the good can prevail and we can live in a more peaceful world, in a, in a, in a world without this uh, big greed. Thank you. How's that for a takeaway? I want to thank everybody on the panel for doing a really wonderful job and contributing in their own special way. And I uh, thank you for joining us. And do go to the book center and, and get your books signed. And uh, check out these two books that I told you about. Uh, Ed's book and my companion of the past two weeks, <coughs> Joseph's book, which has been amazing. And um, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure.